now arriving at Las Vegas Convention Center Station. Hey everybody, it's Dave Dugdale, learningvideo.com. Just got back from NEB yesterday. Um, threw some stuff on the timeline of things that I was kind of interested in. Might not, you guys might not be interested in, I don't know. And what I'm gonna do on this video is just, at the beginning, stuff that I'm most interested about, and the stuff at the very end, I'm still interested, but not as interested. Black Magic Resolve 12.5. That really interests me the most because one of the big things that's been holding me back from using it is because is the whole Kodak support for XAVCS on a Windows platform. Meaning, I would take my stuff, my XAVC files from my A7S2, A7R2, A7S original, drag it onto the timeline and resolve 12, and no audio. I get the video, but no audio. And I'd, you'd have to rewrap it, and it was just a pain in the butt, and I never wanted to get into that. So I'm actually editing this video that you see right here on Resolve 12. I keep pointing this way, and you can't even see it, but my monitor is this way. Um, so that was one of the big things. I mean, I had a bunch of different things. Probably the next biggest item in Resolve 12.5 that I really like is they added the temperature slider and also a green magenta or tint slider. And I say I say slider, but it's really not. I mean, you, you can basically drag your mouse this way and that way across the number and you can make it warmer or cooler. And I really like that um, versus having to do it in the three-way color corrector. You can kind of get off or a little wonky or this is great. Coming from like Lightroom or even Speedgrade, they had this slider and it was wonderful. The other thing that they had was a um, speed ramping, which I've cut other videos in this and I'd go from, I want to speed from like a slow motion shot and back up to real time or vice versa. You couldn't get that nice smooth action and now you can. Um, at least they were demonstrating it to me. I haven't even actually tried it yet. And there's a ton of other features. Um, performance wise, you know, I've already started editing this video, just throwing stuff on the timeline. Responsiveness 12.5 is maybe not as responsive as uh, Premiere Pro that I've been using. Um, and that actually brings up another point. I went by the Premiere, not the Premiere Pro, but the Adobe booth, and I talked to Dave Henley, I think it was. Um, especially on the first day, there was the whole thing of QuickTime on a Windows platform. If you're a Windows user like myself, there's like a two zero day vulnerabilities um, for QuickTime. And I think, talking to Dave Henley, they're, they've got it kind of under control and they're working really hard on it. And he wouldn't give me much more than that, but it sounded like something was gonna happen soon. So, so what happens is if you uninstall QuickTime from your machine and you're, for instance, recording, let's see if I can show it, uh, um, the Shogun, for instance, like I do sometimes, you can record ProRes. Well, when you put ProRes on the timeline or anything, I don't even think it matters if it's, you know, Resolve or Premiere Pro, well, you've lost that codec support, so you won't be able to see what you're trying to edit. Um, so that's a big problem. Um, and I'm actually kind of glad this has happened because I think, especially on the Windows side, QuickTime has been deprecated for a long time on the Windows platform. And it's always lived in this kind of 32-bit environment, kind of in an odd, strange way. And the performance has always suffered. So if you wanted to use any sort of like ProRes type stuff on your Windows machine, you're always doing it kind of in a 32-bit environment rather than a 64-bit environment, which, oh, 64-bit, you know, operating systems and stuff. What did that come out? I don't know, how many years ago? A long time ago. So hopefully whatever Adobe is doing or whatever maybe VLC or whoever else is out there, maybe creating a player and a codec that we can all put on our Windows machine. Hopefully it's free and it'll be, everybody can have it. Uh, hopefully they'll figure that situation out pretty soon. Besides all the gear and equipment, it was just great to see everybody. Like I got to see Eric Naso a few times. Um, he was actually doing some live streaming with uh, just onto Facebook and that actually worked really well. Um, I'm not sure why other people aren't doing that. And I didn't do like any sort of news coverage. That's not something that I do. Um, and Eric was just kind of playing around with it and having fun. And it was just, all the people that came up and said hi, that was fantastic. Uh, it's nice to see everybody. I mean, when I make these YouTube videos in my office, I put them out there and I get comments. But actually to meet people in person that have been watching my videos over the past six years or so, 
Um, it's kind of cool. It's, it's really fun to meet everybody and find out what they're working on. So I was at the Sony booth quite a bit. You know, I'd come back and forth many days um, and ask questions, think of new questions and ask them. Um, but on the last day, there wasn't hardly any people there on Thursday, which is fantastic, which was yesterday. And I went up to the booth in the morning and I saw something I'd never seen before because all the crowds were away from the booth and, you know, the, the counters. And I saw this little tiny recorder. If you're familiar with the a Zoom H1, very tiny recorder, um, you know, it has got microphones built in and you can bring a lav end to the side of it and records to like a micro SD and all that great stuff. Well, this one is pretty cool because it has a cool party trick to it. And I started thinking about uses that I might use it for. Like when I'm flying um, my A7S on a gimbal, let's say, and I'm doing a walk and talk with somebody, well, sometimes it's hard to mount an actual receiver on top of the hot shoe of the Sony because it, then it makes the Sony camera and everything unbalanced on the gimbal, if you know what I'm talking about. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll hand the talent like a smart lav, give them my phone, plug it into my phone and put it into their pocket and they'll just walk with it and then I'll record and I'll do dual sync by clapping my hands. Well, this thing, this ICD SX2000, it's probably just called the SX2000 audio recorder. What it's has a really cool, interesting thing to it and that is you can control it via Bluetooth over your phone. So let's say your talent is away from you, you could just pull your phone out of your pocket and have them talk um, and look at it and you can actually see the levels. And then you can um, adjust the levels. So if they're starting to talk too loud, you can actually bring it down. Uh, I asked them, I was like, can I hear it? Because that would be awesome. Because I know you can send Bluetooth over, or audio over to Bluetooth and I would take, you know, with my smartphone, just take the audio out and have my earphones and I can monitor the audio. That would be sweet. But they said no, unfortunately. I was like, oh, that would be so awesome. But just the fact that you could actually see it. So if I'm not using a gimbal, I could take the smartphone out of my pocket, say, yeah, levels look okay, put it back in my pocket, um, and then check every so often and see it that way. Because again, if you're on a gimbal and you have a receiver on top of the, it, it might not work. I know you could probably mount the receiver off to the side, like on the H2 pilot fly that I'm using, you can mount it off the side, run a cable into the camera. That might work as well. So this is just another option. I thought this was pretty darn cool. So while we're talking about audio, I also ran up into this uh, Audio-Technica AT8024. It's basically, I'd say it's a Rode VideoMic Pro kind of copycat. I, I'm not super happy with the Rode VideoMic Pro because the design and construction and it has a lot of RF that can bleed into it from your smartphone. And one of the tests I did with the Audio-Technica is I had the guy text me and I put the phone right up next to the microphone, no interference. So the shielding on this one was really good. Um, but the problem was, and I was looking at the um, specs on this compared to the Rode VideoMic Pro, this particular microphone looks to be 5 dB um, less sensitive than the Rode. And the Rode is very sensitive, which is great for these cameras like the Sonys or Canons because basically you don't have to use the preamp built into the camera. You can run it very hot and you'll get a very clean signal when you're going directly to the camera like I am right now. Um, but this microphone um, here, best thing I can do is I, I basically was just filming the guy, had the microphone on my A7S, went into my camera, had it brought all the way down. And normally with Rode VideoMic Pro, I'd get a pretty decent level. But, um, and you'll notice I'm trying to point it pretty much directly right at his mouth and go ahead and listen to see how loud it is. Tell me the pricing availability. So this is the AT 8024. You can pick it up at all the major retailers like B&H, Sweetwater, um, Beach Camera, those types of places. You can pick it up for around 249. 249. Yeah. Which is very comparable yeah. to. MSRP is a little bit higher than that, but uh, what you're going to pay on the street is about 249. So. And this is a good test too, because when I talk to see how well it picks yeah, up. It's yeah. Probably, probably firm for yep. Too. So as you can tell, it's not that loud. There could be a few things going on here. Uh, maybe the battery inside it, which is just one single AA, I believe. Or maybe there's two AA's, I can't remember. But anyway, maybe the batteries were running low. And I had the pad setting set to zero, not like minus 15 or minus 20. There was no plus 20 on there, so that might have something to do with it. But maybe I'll get this in for review, because I really couldn't get an idea in that kind of noisy environment how well it would compare to like the Rode VideoMic Pro that I'm using now. 
Another thing I spent a lot of time on was walking around the show floor looking at a lot of different lenses. I obviously spent a ton of time at the Sony booth trying out like the you know 24 to 70 2.8. The 7200 was under glass. Actually, it was chopped in half. <laughs> I couldn't get to it. Um, of course, you can't use half a lens, but I couldn't use it. But there was a lot of other lenses I was trying that I never even knew about. I think there was like a 70 to 300 I was trying. There was a whole bunch. Um, because a lot of times with the A7S, those are like, I like to put full frame glass on that. But my A7R2, I shoot in APS-C mode with, for video most of the time. So there's a lot of different options I didn't even know about. So I was definitely looking at those. I was all around the floor. I was trying to find out all the different new E-mounts. Um, I talked to the guys over at the Zeiss booth and tried a bunch of their new lenses like the 85. I think there was a new 18 that looked pretty nice. Um, they also had, you know, if you're looking for autofocus, those were working really well. And they also had a bunch of them, um, I think the Loxia, Loxia, I believe. I was trying some of those, and those are more, um, they're all manual focus for the E-mount. And, you know, I was also looking at, um, I was surprised to actually find Tekina. And if you're familiar with the old Canon days, the uh, everybody loved the Tekina 11 to 16 for an APS-C and they had one with gears on it and everything like that for the e-mount so if you were going to use it for your a7r2 or your a6300 and that was one of the things you know looking around the show floor you really get an idea of what's happening in the industry because um, all these people that are at neb um, are pretty up on the technology and just looking around you're like i think i don't think i saw anybody with a 5d mark iii nobody saw a lot of a7s a7S Mark IIs, um, but probably the thing I think I saw the most was the new Sony A6300 because it's a small, lightweight camera. Everybody's carrying around a very small, lightweight camera so they could kind of document stuff like I was doing. Um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, I don't know what Canon's doing. In fact, while we're on the top of Canon, let's talk about this right now. I did go by their booth and I did enjoy one thing a lot, and I'm kind of hoping that Sony will actually pick this up on their next iteration of their their a7 cameras but that was the wonderful dual pixel autofocus that they have but they had a touch screen i think it was the 1dx or 1dc 1dx i, I can't remember but basically I, I basically wanted to experience it and sure enough you would point on the person's face and then you drag your finger to like the background and release and the background would go and focus and then you pick the background and you drag to their face and it would it wouldn't go womp 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 it would just snap right to it really nice action i'm like oh man i hope you know the next iteration of the a6300 or the a7r2 or whatever more phase detection points and yeah touch screen we need a touch screen on the sony cameras that would be awesome so if sony's watching this add that that would be good so at the show there was definitely a lot of different gimbals to play with um, and that's what's great about the show is you can just go over to one booth try one and go over to the other booth, try another, and they're usually pretty close to one another. Um, so you could try a lot of different things and kind of process of elimination, just get rid of some possibilities and narrow the playing field down. Um, so let me let me show, first up, um, going way back, you guys probably remember I reviewed the Nebula 4000 light. Well, they have the Nebula 4100 light. And there was also, I think, a 4200 I tried, but I basically had springs. And as I walked, it kind of took it out of it. And uh, I don't know if it worked that well, because I was trying to walk very steady and it actually seemed to make it, make it, made it worse. But when I walked without trying to be, you know, nice and ninja-like, it actually seemed to be smoother. I don't know, maybe it was the way the, the springs were adjusted. I'm not really looking for that fifth axis or whatever kind of thing, or fourth axis, that Z axis or the up and down. Um, I'd rather just learn how to walk better. Um, so actually the Nebula 4, 4100 light, I tried it for a while, uh, and I, maybe a minute or two, not that long. And it felt like I was getting some, um, micro vibrations in it. And again, I'm, I'm kind of hoping that they had the camera that you see here. It was a pretty lightweight camera was well balanced when he handed it to me, but I was feeling some things that didn't make me feel very confident about that particular one. Um, the next one up, um, oh, let me also mention that they had some innovative ways, um, since they're mounting the battery off the handle and putting on the back of the camera, 
they had some interesting or innovative ways to put the handle so you could get a lower mode or inverted mode um, without holding the thing like this. You could actually hold it like this, which I thought was pretty cool. Uh, the next one up, uh, I looked at the um, Kame TV, I think it's called the Optimus, and this one's running for, it's not out yet, I think it was maybe out a few months. Where is the price? Sorry for this. Makes for bad, not radio, but bad video. <laughs> Looks like it's going to be around $1,400. Uh, so a bit more expensive. I don't know if that comes with the dual handles or not, but when I was there trying it, um, it worked really well um, this way. And when I went to invert it, which apparently you can do, it's got to auto invert within the software. Um, when I went around like this and it was still upside down and then I brought it down to the ground, it was kind of making my hand do this. So the, the motors were kind of wobbling around a bit. Um, even though I was trying to hold my hand steady, it was kind of doing this. So again, I don't know if they had that set up right or maybe it was the camera or maybe somebody before me had the camera and knocked it off balance. I don't know. Um, but again, it was, this one didn't seem like it had the best inverted mode to me anyway. Uh, moving on. So what else we got? The uh, ICANN or DS1. This one doesn't have any encoders. Um, I was at the ICANN, but I, Team Rebel Design was also there, um, but I didn't find their booth. So I was just playing around with this one. This one doesn't have any encoders. And uh, I, when I tried the MS one, the one before this one, I didn't have much luck adjusting it. And this one looks like it's all toolless. So it looks like all of them now are toolless, which is fantastic. Um, even including the uh, Nebula 4000 light. So we've definitely passed that part. <laughs> um, what else do we got? So, and then I was at the um, pilot fly booth and that's the one I've just, if you haven't watched before, I released maybe a week or two ago, the pilot fly H2 that I've got right here in my office. And that one works great. Um, it's got encoders, 32 bit, um, battery life is 26 hours or whatever. Um, inverted mode works fantastic so so far of all the gimbals that i tried and i even went like over to the dji booth and tried some of theirs um, with the dual handle but most of the part i was trying single-handed grip pistol grip style and so far um the front runner to me seems like the the h2 am i gonna buy the h2 I think I'm going to wait a few more months because um, talking to some of the gimbal manufacturers, it sounds like there's another one might be coming out in a few months. So I'm actually going to hold off on that one. I'm not going to say which one it is. Um, so you might see a review from me probably in the summer on that next one. And that will be probably the one I'm going to buy. Um, so that that's all I'll say at this point because I, the person I talked to, it sounded like he didn't want me to, to mention that. So I've had a Canova slider. Uh, I don't know, it's, I think it's 80 centimeters, something like that, maybe uh, three feet or so. I've had that slider for, I don't know, five years. And I've used it occasionally. I don't use it that much because it's big, bulky, heavy, travel bag, all that stuff. And I'm like, there was a couple of options that really caught my eye at the show. One was at the, what, Aldachrome booth? A little, I think called the slider one. It's really tiny. I'll show you some B-roll of it. Um, really, really tiny. Uh, and then there was another one, I think it was Live Tech. Um, and let me see if I can get you the part number. I think it's called the ALX S4. It's about foot of travel. But what's really interesting about this one is that inside the the wheels themselves, I, the guy was telling me something that somehow got hydraulic fluid in the wheels themselves. So once you get the thing up to speed, there's this kind of inertia or really even pressure that feel you, you just it's a really nice smooth slide. And I'll, I'll show you. Um, as I'm talking here, I basically I just mounted my camera on it and I just started sliding it back and forth. You can see a little bit towards the end and then I started to get up to speed again. It's really smooth. This is without a motor. This is just with me with my hand, not practicing with this for, you know, weeks. This is just like the first time I ever used it. And as you can see, I think that I was filming with a 35 millimeter lens. Um, it's pretty smooth. It worked out pretty well now i i had footage of the slider one from eldacrone and that one's great because it's really expensive it's like 200 dollars. it's like come on guys this should be 80 dollars um 
I could put it in my backpack and just slide it right in and I would always have it. I, I could always leave it mounted on my fluid head or something like that. And whenever I needed to do a slide and I had a, maybe a foreground object, I could always get some of that parallaxing kind of going on. And I think that would be great to have. Just pull it out of the camera bag, I could get some slider movements just when I need it without having to lug around a big long slider. So for me, I'm kind of toying with this, the Live Tech or the Slider One. Um, both of those look very small and portable. Um, maybe, you know, the Slider One is, I don't know, the travel is pretty small. It's not much at all. Maybe you got a, maybe six inches or something like that, where the Live Tech's 12 inches. Um, but again, the lighter it is, the smaller it is, the faster I can set it up, the more I'm going to use it. And I haven't been using the slider much because it's kind of a pain. Um, and I would I'd love to get back to get some of those fluid motions again. I spent a lot of time at the Flanders booth. And one of the things I've, I know you, it's out of frame, but you've probably seen it many times before. I've got this wonderful LG 34 inch monitor. It's curved. I love it. I haven't really done a review on this one. Maybe I should talk about it at some point, but I really like it. I love all the real estate. Colors seem to be pretty accurate. Seems pretty good. Um, but I know you can't see it, but off here, I've got a vase mount ready to go for a second monitor. And one of the things I did at the show, which is great, you just walk around and look at different monitors, is um, I'm really interested in like some of the really higher end Flander monitors. Um, they're kind of pricey. And there was two of them that uh, I'm kind of bouncing back and forth between. One uh, on the right hand side is the AM210. It's an LCD, it's like 21 or 22 inch. It's 8-bit. So if you're doing, you know, I was talking to the guys a lot at the Flanders booth. If you're doing YouTube videos like I do, I'm not doing anything to like a movie theater or anything like that. I'm not a professional colorist. He was like, this one would be, probably be better for you, you know, because it's only $2,000. Um, but the other one on the left-hand side is the AM2500, which is around a $5,000 OLED, and it's nice. I mean, look at the difference between the, the black bars here above. Um, the, you can see the OLED is just like inky black, whereas the LCD, you can obviously see it's not a true black. Um, I don't know if I'd necessarily know how to color grade with an OLED, Maybe I wouldn't bring everything down to black. Maybe I would bring it down to like three IRE. I don't know how I would do that. So the LCD is definitely caught my eye. And I spent a lot of time looking back and forth between the two um, with my, just with my eye. And I couldn't tell any difference in color. But now that I'm looking at the footage of when I shot it at this angle, because he couldn't move both monitors flat, unfortunately, um, so I could view them side by side but at, I was like a 45 degree angle for both. And you can say there's definitely a color difference, which I couldn't perceive when I was there. And definitely the OLED seemed to be brighter in the brights. I mean, the blacks are inky black, so the contrast was definitely better on the OLED. But man, the OLED is $5,000, man. <laughs> I would love to buy it, but I'm really not a professional color. So, and then it brings up the whole thought of the whole HDR. I got to see some wonderful, um, displays in the Sony booth because they have some HDR monitors and they look pretty impressive. You know, they would turn it on and off for me going from like a hundred nits to like a thousand nits. And it's like, oh yeah, I can definitely see that. But I, you know, I think this whole HDR thing, I was talking to a lot of my colors friends at the show and like my colors friends are like, usually the colors that I know, professional colors are like the smartest people in the room. They know freaking everything. And they were telling me if you're going to, do something with HDR. I wouldn't do it for another six to eight months until this whole standard thing shakes out because it sounds like it's a big mess right now. You know, it, I don't even know. <laughs> but um, so I'm, unfortunately Flanders doesn't have an agreement with B&H and I can't get one in for review and compare it against to, for like the Sony version. Um, so I don't know what I'm gonna do on that one, but I was I was at their Flanders booth for a long time, so that's kind of where I'm going. I, I definitely need a second monitor, and I haven't I've had several in from B and H that were cheaper, and I haven't done a review on them because they were just terrible. Um, so maybe I'll, when I finally figure out what my second monitor is going to be, especially with Resolve, you need a second monitor. Um, in Premiere Pro, the way the scaling's done, um, I, I've been able to live in a 34 inch monitor quite well, but with Resolve, you really really need a, like a 1080 
reference monitor. I went over to the Ari booth. Um, I was interested in the Alexa, which I don't know, was like what, 80 grand or something like that. Um, and I, I don't know much about this camera because most of the time I'm using much smaller cameras and I really don't know much about the big boy pants cameras. <laughs> and this one was, uh, I was just asking him questions like, you know, how old is the sensor? And the guy was like, the sensor is like five or six years old. They haven't changed it. I'm like, why haven't you changed it? And they're like, well, the DPs that use it for all the, you know, Hollywood movies that you see like this sensor. So if we're going to change it, we're going to make sure it's really good. So I was like, I was amazed that the sensor in this thing, which is not even 4k, it's like, I don't know. I don't know exactly what it is, but they, they upscale it somehow very well to be 4k. Um, so I just thought that was very interesting that, you know, Red has been changing their sensors. Sony has been changing their sensors probably every two years. Canon's been changing their sensors probably every three years or so. Um, and then the Alexa, I haven't changed it since like six years old. And it's not even a true 4K sensor. And But yet it's the most popular, most expensive camera out there, which I just thought was ironic. Many of you know, I've been like looking at a lot of different LED lights and I've bought a, a a bunch of large ones, but I need smaller ones. And I was over at the Aperture booth and Ted was showing me a couple of them. I know other people were very interested in them as well, but this small one right here caught my eye. You can like run it off like a USB. I've got one of these um, USB, uh, like when I charge my phone or a lot of times I'll use this when I want to power my A7S II for a long period of time. I just plug it into the USB with this battery and I can do time lapses for a very long time, but apparently you could use something like this to power a light like that, and it's like a 120 watt bulb equivalent. Um, and then they have one um, that's like the size of a credit card. So if I need a little accent lights, um, I might definitely take a look at these um, if they're available on the B&H store pretty soon and get these in for a review. So definitely watch out for a video on that. And let's see, the last thing, oh, this was kind of interesting. So I went up to the Hoodman booth about a year ago and I was like, hey, do you have like a, a you know, an eye cup, larger eye cup that can seal my eye? And they were like, oh yeah, we got one for the A7. It'll be out in a month. And I'm like, and if you've watched my review of the eye cup, I've told this story before where, you know, like a month later, I'm like, hey, where's the eye cup? And they're like, oh, it's another month. And then I was like, uh, six months later, I call them up and it's like, oh, it's gonna be another month. And sure enough, when did they release it? Pretty much a year to the day. And they're like, I went up to the booth and said, do you have the eye cup? And they're like, yeah, here, it's right, it's right here. And apparently I have two versions. So look out for a review on that. I don't know what the model numbers are, but it's for the A7S. I'm sure if you went on their website, you could find it. It sounded like it was around $20, $25. He said, I guess on the show floor, they were selling them for like 20 bucks. But um, yeah, that I'll definitely review that against the other two that I've got in for review and we can finally finish that review. So that's pretty much it of all the different things that I saw at NAB. Again, it was really fun meeting everybody that came up and said hi. Um, and it was great on the last day, Thursday, because there was like nobody there. I like, I would swear like 60% of the crowd was gone on that last day. So you could, I asked tons of questions. I mean, there's things I'm not covering in this video that I saw and I asked, you know, like at the Sony booth, I'm talking about S-Log2 and S-Log3, which has more dynamic range, you know, exposing to the high, for the highlights. What does that do to the dynamic range? I was asking a lot of technical questions, uh, you know, with the Sony's reps, um, you know, especially with some of those guys and I was giving them suggestions. I don't know if they're going to listen to me. Um, there's also like, you know, meta information. I was like, in your catalyst program, you got all this great meta information. I can see the ISO, the shutter speed and all that stuff. But when I bring in a premiere, I lose all that. Where's that metadata? And like, I've got to resolve. I can't find that metadata. I'd love to have that you know, like, what did I shoot that with? And what did I, what, what was the white balance and stuff like that. So, um, I was talking to some of their Sony engineers and they were taking notes and they're like, okay, well, I was like, maybe you could write a white paper on how, you know, uh, companies like Adobe or who else could actually access that kind of information. So that's pretty much how this turned into a longer video than I really wanted to, but, uh, that's pretty much it for NEB and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.